Christian greetings and uh, salutation. We are so much glad and grateful to our God for this far that he has brought us. And uh, as we end the Sabbath, I want us to do a current update even as we continue with our study on righteousness by faith. And before we begin, let us believe even as we pray. Our dear loving Father in heaven, glory and honor be unto your name for your goodness. Thank you so much for the Sabbath and even for the messages that you have warmed our hearts with. Even as we do our study this hour again, we still plead for the guidance of your spirit. Well, Lord, as we live in these final scenes of this earth history, how we pray that you may help us to be diligent, that as we study your word, we may also plead and pray for your guidance that we may live the gospel that you've permitted us to receive, that we may embrace them and they may work in us both to will and even to do of your good pleasure. As we study, may your will be done, even as you lead us. It's our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We want to continue. And with this, our current events update, I just want to call to our attention what we are told in the book, Gospel Workers, page 148, paragraph number 2. We are told the 24th chapter of Matthew is presented to me again and again as something that is to be brought to the attention of all. We are today living in the time when the predictions of this chapter are fulfilling. So as we look at Matthew chapter number 24, where Christ delineates the events that will have to take place and even to transpire in the world before his second advent, we are told here that they are in the process of their fulfillments. The predictions we are given in Matthew 24, the same signs of the times, are also revealed in Mark chapter 13. You will also find them in the book of Luke chapter number 21. But I want us to focus on an event here in Matthew chapter number 24. It continues to say, let our ministers and teachers explain these prophecies to those whom they instruct. Let them leave out of their discourses matters of minor consequence and present the truths that will decide the destiny of souls. One of the chapters in the Bible that will always define and decide the destiny of our souls is Matthew 24. What is this in Matthew 24 that God will want us to learn, that is going to warm our hearts and to arouse us, to wake us up, that we may realize the danger in which we are in and what God calls for, that which is going to be essential for us to stand in the crisis that is looming. In looking at Matthew 24, I want us to focus on verses number 6 and 7. Verse 6 says, They will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. So what Christ foretold that which we are witnessing in this our time being fulfilled, one of them is pestilences. When we are talking about pestilences, we mean diseases of every kind. The prophetess of the Lord was also not left in darkness concerning the pestilences that will have to be witnessed in these final scenes and hours of this earth history. This is what she has to say. In Great Controversy, page 589, she says, Satan 
works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. What will he use to garner unprepared souls into his harvest? He has, he has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. When he was suffered to a flake job, how quickly flocks and herds, servants, houses, children, quickly flocks, our uh, children were swept away, one trouble succeeding another as in a moment. So we are told the enemy will work in the laboratories of nature. Now under today we talk of climate change, that due to climate change, there are series of calamities in the world and they need to curb all these calamities. The solution is aiming and targeting God's people. So beloved, all that Christ foretold that will be witnessed coming to pass before us, one of them is pestilences. And we are told Satan will work with the elements of the hair to garner unprepared souls into his harvest. This quotation continues to say, It is God that shields his creatures and ages them in from the power of the destroyer. But the Christian world have shown contempt for the law of Jehovah. And the Lord will do just what he has declared that he would he will withdraw his blessings from the earth and remove his protecting care from those who are rebelling against his law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Satan has control of all whom God does not especially guard. He will favor and prosper some in order to further his own designs. And he will bring trouble upon others and lead men to believe that it is God who is afflicting them. There's another principle that you also need to understand, that which the enemy will use to deceive and delude men in these closing hours of this earth history. And that principle is order out of chaos. He will have to create chaos and try to bring order so that he can further on his malice and designs to destroy souls in the world. What do we need to know about the pestilences? In the same book, paragraph number three, he says, while appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring disease and disaster. What will Satan bring? He is also having power. That's why we have been told he studies the laboratories of nature. And when God will permit him, he will bring disease and disaster. Until popular cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Notice where he will target first. Where there is vast majority. In popular, popular cities where people are so many that this population will be reduced to ruin. Even now he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempest, floods, cyclones, tidal waves and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. Notice the final sentences of this paragraph. He says, he sweeps away the ripening harvest, and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint, and thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Friends, this prediction is being fulfilled before us, that Satan will have to impart to the hair a deadly taint. It's when we experience COVID-19 
And I know through it thousands and thousands died. Some were vaccinated. They wanted them to be zombies. And it is by God's grace that we are still alive. We are told that these pestilences will become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beasts. No escape here except we abide in Christ Jesus. So it was just recently here when we experienced COVID-19 globally. What do they have for us again? And friends, as we near the end of this world history, we'll have to witness more and more of these diseases and pestilences. And the aim of Satan is to destroy the human family. They are working so that they can reduce the population of the world. That's why they introduce diseases and come up with a solution that will still help them to reduce the population in the world. What is currently out? Notice what we are told here. This is what is currently out. They have entered into the laboratory and they have come up with another disease with an aim to clear those who are in the world. World health leaders warn of pandemic and they say it is 20 times worse than COVID. What is this pandemic here? What is its name? This is current, beloved. This is just August. What is this pandemic that is deadly and 20 times worse than COVID-19? Prepare for the next pandemic. Future pathogens with even deadlier potential than COVID. World Health Organization chief warns. This is just last month. August 2024, they gave us this update that they have already made another disease to kill God's people. World Health Organization declares monkeypox a global public health emergency. So they are saying that they have come up with another pandemic called monkeypox with the aim of destroying the human family. Friends, we are living at the verge of this world history. It is time for us to prepare a character that is going to fit us for eternity. It is time for us to depart from sin and to live a life that is going to fit us for that mansion that Christ went to prepare for us. Just a wake-up call. We are told growing monkeypox outbreaks prompts World Health Organization to declare global health emergency. And of course, they are going to come up with, with the poison to kill God's people in the name of vaccine. So people will have to be vaccinated again with the aim of destroying their health and uh, depleting their vital force that we can therefore depend upon this forgers, these people who, whose aim is to destroy the human family. As cases of monkeypox arise again, here is what you need to know. This was released August 15, 2024, just a few weeks ago. Friends, our lives are at stake. It is time to return to our God. As monkeypox continues to cross borders, is the U.S. prepared for an outbreak? For this global pandemic, it will have to touch every continent, every country in this world. Notice how it looks like. Monkeypox declared public health emergency in Africa. So this is how it looks like. It looks like even the experience that those who will be wicked will receive in uh, the first plague of Revelation chapter number 16. Beloved, and I know at that time God will be now avenging his children and he will now 
pay back what Satan has permitted God's children and God's children to experience. COVID-19, monkeypox, and any other disease that they will come up with. We are told currently the world is being warned of an outbreak of monkeypox. Tedros, uh, World Health Organization Director General, is giving us this update of the pandemic that they are saying is already out. Time for preparation. What are we to do in this time of preparation? When we are witnessing all this, this is what we are told is also cooking behind the curtains. As we witness this pandemics, there is another thing that God would want us to know. Notice what we are told in the next slide. In Great Controversy, page 590.1. And then, after witnessing all these pandemic and calamities and pestilences, notice their target now. It says, And then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. When we see this pandemic pestilences breaking out, people are dying, people are being vaccinated, they die, population is being decreased. We are told they will come to a point of saying it is because of those who are violating the Sunday sacredness. We are told the class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. It will be declared that men are offending God by violation by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday's observance shall be strictly enforced. How far are we from the crisis? We are near, brethren. Friends of Jesus, we are near the crisis that we have been anticipating for long. For so many years, we have been talking about the Sunday law. It is here with us. As we witness COVID-19, and now they are warning us of the monkeypox. Friends, with all these calamities and pestilences, they are going to say that God's people who are violating that erroneous and uh, false Sabbath Sunday are the ones that are now bringing all this trouble upon the world. They have to be done away with. Friends, we are nearing a crisis as never before. God calls us to make a thorough preparation for eternity. It is true that it is not time for us now to continue in sin. It is not time for us to entertain sin and evil. It is time for us to overcome. No wonder we are called for to seek for the righteousness of Christ, both the imputed and the imparted righteousness of Christ. We need it now. I want to lay for us a foundation of overcoming sin. What is this that we need in our Christian experience for to overcome sin? And what we are to discuss now is to lead us to overcome sin. And without a clear understanding of it, we are not going to stand in the crisis and we are going to continue in sin till Christ comes. No time to sin. Notice testimonies to ministers and gospel workers, page 147, paragraph 1. It says, My brethren, we are living in a most solemn period of this earth history. There is never time to sin. It is always perilous to continue in transgression. But in a special sense, is this true at the present time? I know we'll answer boldly that it is not true. 
when God is calling us to depart from sin is when we entertain sin. And that is so perilous and dangerous, friends. God calls us to overcome. God calls us to live a life that is in harmony with his law. God calls us to renounce every sin, every evil thought that we may cherish, that we may live a life that is going to fit us for eternity. We are now upon the very borders of the eternal world and stand in a more solemn relation to time and to eternity than ever before. That we are at the borders of this earth is to, we are at the verge. And if we will realize that we are at the verge of Jordan, we are almost closing to Canaan, then we are going to be aroused and to be revived and to be reformed that we may understand the will of God and even to manifest it in our lives. Friends, it is time to overcome sin. But what is this that God has laid for us to lead us to overcome sin and to live a righteous life? With a clear understanding of this principle, then we are going to live a life that shows that indeed we are prepared for the crisis and even for the imminent return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice what we are told. For if we live a careless life, there are certain actions that we can indulge in and engage in, thinking that we are right with God. I want us to have a look at Steps to Christ, page 58, paragraph number 1. Lest we be deceived. I want to show us the foundation of every victory of sin. For us to have victory over every sin, there is a foundation of it. And that foundation of victory over every kind of sin will also be the foundation of every crime known to the human family. That is a principle that we all need to understand and embrace if at all we are going to overcome sin and to live a godly life. It says, it is true that there may be an outward correctness of deportment without the renewing power of Christ. The love of influence and the desire for the esteem of others may produce a well-ordered life. Self-respect may lead us to avoid the appearance of evil. A selfish act may perform generous actions. What do we mean by this? Can it be possible that I can perform generous actions, but I'm still cherishing selfishness in my heart? It is possible. The question therefore is, by what means then shall we determine whose side we are on? That is a good question that we need to ponder upon. How then will I know the side that I am in? Lest I be deceived that I am serving God and yet I am doing against His will. How will we know? It continues to say, Who has the heart? With whom? are our thoughts, of whom do we love to converse, who has our warmest affections and our best energies. If we are Christ, our thoughts are with him, and our sweetest thoughts are of him. All we have and are is consecrated to him. We long to bear his image, breathe his spirit, do his will, and please him in all things. How will we be for Christ? How will we know that we are on the side of Christ and not of the enemy? How is this one possible? Those who become new creatures in Christ Jesus will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. How will we know that we are on Christ's side when we bear fruits of the Spirit? And one of those fruits of the Spirit of God 
is the principle for overcoming every sin. It says love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Beloved, what I want to share with us is this fruit of the Spirit called temperance. What is it that we need to know about temperance and victory over sin? What we need is victory over sin. For we are living in a time that God will want his children to overcome every sin. For we are living at the borders of the eternal world. Notice what we are told about temperance. But notice the experience of those who are to stand in the time of test. What is this that we need to stand in the time of test? In the third angel's message, the Bible says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. For us to stand in the test that is awaiting us, we need to be patient. That patience of the saints need to be revealed in our Christian experience. The next question will therefore be, what is this experience or principle that precedes patience? That principle or fruit that must have to be seen in our lives first before we manifest patience that is needed in us. It answers this in 2 Peter chapter 1 verses number 5 through 7. The experience that is needed, that principle that precedes patience that is needed in the saints for us to stand in the test that is coming. With all these pandemics and pestilences that we have seen, they are targeting God's people and it is drawing us closer to the time of our test. For us to stand, we need patience. But what is this principle that precedes patience? And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. Even if I stop it at that point, you'll realize that before we manifest the spirit of patience, we first need temperance. We are to be temperate. What are we to know about temperance? It is next to an impossibility for an intemperate person to be patient. Friends, there is no excuse in this. There is no middle ground in this principle here. Without temperance, no patience. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. For us to be patient, we must first be temperate in all things. An impatient man, an intemperate man will always be impatient. We should make decided efforts to be on the right side in every matter. We are on a battleground and Satan is striving for our souls. No impatient man or woman will ever enter into the course of heaven. That is how strict it is. That with impatience we cannot inherit the courts of heaven. But for us to be impatient we first need to be intemperate. So what is the solution of being patient? Patient, We must be temperate. No intemperate man will be patient. He will have to be impatient. I don't know if you are understanding the concept that God is trying to impress in our hearts of the preparation that is needed of us. That in the 
crisis that is coming, we need to be patient. And for us to be patient, we first need to cultivate that principle of, intem- of temperance. What is temperance? True temperance teaches us to dispense entirely with everything artful and to use judiciously that which is helpful. When we are looking at the eight doctors of health, that is new start. You realize that temperance must be there. And if God's people are not going to be temperate in all things, no health will be realized in their lives. God will want us to prosper in health, even as our soul prospereth. But for us to prosper in health, God's people must be temperate. And a temperance we are told that you dispense entirely with that which is hurtful. That which is not needed, you do away with it completely. Not doing it halfway. Not doing it in a smaller degree. You do away with it completely. That is how we need to regard sin. We do away with it entirely. And doing the will of God with the whole of our hearts. That is temperance. Notice this. Have you been seeking for a way of gaining victory over sin? The foundation is given us here. The foundation of all victories known to man. The Bible says, I want to read with us a pile of inspiration. The temperance is the foundation of all victories known to men. Notice what we are told in the book Temperance, page 201, paragraph number 4. It says the following. It says that, As God's messenger, I come to you and demand your names. Neither of you have seen the necessity of health reform. But when the plagues of God shall be all around you, you will then see the principles of health reform and strict temperance in all things. Some of us, we are going to long to be temperate in all things. Once we are now seeing it is too late and the plagues are now falling. That is the point we are going to realize that we were to be strict and to be temperate in all things. Why temperance? We are told that temperance alone, nothing else, is the foundation of all the graces that come from God, the foundation of all victories to be gained. If you want the foundation of overcoming every sin that still beset us and nail us and bring us down, the foundation of all the victories that is to be gained by the human family, the foundation is temperance. We are to be temperate in all things. When Paul was exhorting the Corinthians, using the aspect and uh, that which they loved, foot racing, he told them for someone to win that corruptible prize and crown, that person had to be temperate in all things. When they were going for foot racing and they realized that It will require strength of the muscle. They will discard everything that was hurtful, everything that will hinder the flexibility, something that will do away with the synovial fluid in the joints and do harm to the cartilages. They will do away with them. If it is tobacco, they will do away with tobacco. If it is coffee, they will do away with coffee and every other hurtful indulgence that will interfere with their muscle and joints. Paul exhorting them, told them this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 and 25. Know ye not that they who run in a race all run, but one receiveth the prize, so run that he may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in 
all things. We are to exercise temperance in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But ours is incorruptible. So how strict are we to be? Notice this again. When we are considering the fall of our first parents in the Garden of Eden, do you know where their problem was? It was on the point of temperance. When God commanded man on how they were to live and eat and use what was given them in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mightst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. Adam and Eve, get this clearly. It was Adam first who was alive hearing the voice of God. And God addressing and commanding Adam. He tells Adam, Adam, you need to be temperate. And I am in the business of qualifying you to be part of the heavenly family. But only if you are going to be obedient to my commands. And my command to you is be temperate. Have a limit. I have given you every tree, but of this tree, don't dare touch it. Don't dare eat it. Temperance. And do you know that was the least test that God could give man? And they failed. On the point of temperance, all who are not going to be careless, all who are going to be indolent and careless, and not careful, are going to fall. In child guidance, we are told that the history of Adam and Eve's disobedience in the very beginning of this earth history is fully given. By that one act of disobedience, our first parents lost their beautiful lady in home, and it was such a little thing. We have reason to be thankful that it was not a larger matter. Because if it had been, little disregards in disobedience would have been multiplied. It was the least test. Temperance was the least test that God could subject man to. They failed. Friends, we need the power of Christ to overcome. In temperance lies at the foundation of all the moral evils known to man. Before man falls, he will have to be intemperate. For that is the foundation of all victories. Temperance is the foundation of all victories known to man. If you want to fall, you have first to be intemperate. That is what I'm going to show you as we pray. We are told that intemperance, the opposite of being temperate, is the foundation of all the crimes and moral evils known to the human family. For Christ to overcome, we are told, Christ began the work of redemption just where the ruin began. The ruin began with intemperance. So he had to be temperate. We are also to be temperate if we are going to overcome. The fall of our first parents was caused by the indulgence of appetite. They were intemperate in what they were eating. The command was clear. Do not partake of this tree. Have a limit. They never had a limit. They fell into sin. The controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands. When if they had conquered on this point, they will have all, they will have had moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. Satan will lead man to be intemperate in what he is introducing into the body temple. Appetite will not only touch on what we eat alone, but it will also touch on what we watch, what we listen, what we touch. Friends, we are to be temperate in all things. That is what Satan understands, that if they will be temperate, then they will overcome other temptations that I will lay for them. But if they are going to be intemperate, 
if they are going to be possessed of this demon of intemperance, then they are going to be defeated. They are going to fall into my traps and snares all the times of, the, of their lives. Adam's fall was as a result of intemperance. It is also worth noting that intemperance is a demon. Friends, people are demon-possessed. And uh, this demon of intemperance is difficult to overcome. It will require self-denial and self-sacrifice and Christ to abide in our hearts for us to overcome intemperance. We are almost bringing this to a close. It says, the demon of intemperance is not easily conquered. It is of giant strength and hard to overcome. A crusade must be held against this principle of intemperance. If we are to overcome, we are to be temperate in all things. That is a principle that God will want to inculcate in man so that man can overcome sin. Man can overcome every temptation of Satan. Notice what we are told in our Father Cares. Page 30, paragraph number 2. The Apostle Paul declares that he would be successful in reaching a high standard of godliness that he who would be successful in reaching a high standard of godliness must be temperate in all things. The ideal that God calls us to reach is godliness, being like God. For us to be like God, we must be temperate in all things. Temperate in what? We are told we have to be temperate in what we are eating. We have to be temperate in what we are drinking. We are to be temperate in what we are, we are dressing. That all this have a direct bearing upon our spiritual advancement. It will be until we be temperate in our diet, in our dress code, in our music, in our sources of entertainment, is when we are going to overcome at all points and even to advance spiritually. Beloved, I don't know if you feel your need of Christ that he may inculcate in us this principle of temperance for without temperance we cannot be patient and in the crisis God calls for patience of the saints no intemperate man will be patient man therefore God calls us to watch the avenues of the soul that we can overcome sin. If we are not going to be temperate in what we watch, in what we listen to, in what we touch, how we dress, all these things, if we are not going to be temperate, then we are not going to be overcomers. Quick readings, even as we wind it up. The apostle sought to teach the believers how important it is to keep the mind from wandering to forbidden themes or from spending its energies on trifling subjects. Those who will not fall a prey to Satan's devices must be temperate, must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. The mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls may suggest. The heart must be faithfully sentineled. For evils without will awaken evils within, and the soul will wander in darkness. Temperance in all things. Allow me give us a secret of a man of God who was temperate in all things. This is what the Bible says concerning this man who was temperate in all things. Job, we are told, was temperate. And he guarded well the avenues of his soul. 
The Bible says in Job 31 verse 1, that I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Job made a covenant with his eyes, that he will be temperate in what he will set his eyes upon. And the record that we are given of this man in chapter 1, verses number 1, the same book of Job, is that there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and shunned evil. He was a perfect and upright. Why? He was temperate in what he was seeing. For us to be safe, this is the principle that God gives us. Philippians chapter 4 verse number 8. This is the principle that is going to guard and to lead us. It says, Finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is any praise, think on these things. If we are going to subscribe to this principle given us in Philippians chapter 4, verses number 8, this is a principle that teaches true temperance. That only things that are just lovely, of good report, pure, honest, true, those are the things that God will want us to meditate and think about. That we may not be at Satan's trap and to be ensnared by him, to be led captive at his own will. If we are to overcome, God calls us to be temperate in all things. That temperance is the foundation of all the victories to be gained with the human family. Intemperance is a demon. And it lies at the foundation of every moral evil known to man. Beloved, God calls us to be temperate. Temperance is a principle that needs to be cultivated now before it is too late. May we pray that God may help us cultivate this principle of temperance. That we may live a life that is in accordance with the will of God. May God bless you even as you meditate upon this concept here this principle here of temperance. And at the end, may we be temperate in all things. God bless you even as we pray. Eternal God divine, thank you so much for touching our lives and hearts this evening with the events that are transpiring around us and even the response that we need to give unto all these events that we are witnessing now. Forgive us all of, of all our sins. Draw us close unto you. And above all things, may you teach us to be temperate in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.